Hey guys, I'm Big Mike, and like always, I'd like to thank you for being here today. Today we have another Ask Me Anything with FT71. The AMAs are designed to be quick and casual. We're going to limit it to about 30 minutes. I'll post the recording after we're done. Go ahead and start typing your questions, and uh, as we get set up and turn control over to FT71, um, we can start uh, taking a look at this. How's it going, FT? Good. Good. Thanks for having me on again. Sure. Anytime. Right, let's switch over. I'm just going to display my main ES chart. Uh, I just want to remind everyone that trading futures, options on futures, is not suitable for all uh, for all investors, and that uh, past performance is not indicative. Um, what questions do we have, Mike? Let's take a look. Looks like the first one is from Rex. And he's basically saying he understands that there's a four or five point rotation in the ES, then probability of a rotation continuing without a one and a half point pullback is relatively low. But what about if there's a six, seven, or eight point rotation? For example, if we get a seven point rotation into a zone, does this give you super high confidence or does the larger rotation make you hesitant to step in front of the move? Okay, uh, really good question. So, um, Am I here? I don't know what's going on with this mic. You're you're back now, yeah. Am I here, Mike? Yeah, we got you. Yeah, I don't know why my uh, my Bluetooth headset here is, just keeps switching off. Um, knowing the rotations for the ES is very important uh, because you know, or for any product, every product has a rhythm in which it trades. There's a, there are habits to the participants within that product. It looks like we're giving up the 15 quarter in ES. I just tweeted that out. Uh, so expecting new lows now, looking for a test of 1804 next for those who trade the ES. But uh, knowing one of the things you should know about the product that you're trading, not only daily range, um, daily range, how often it, uh, it tests a non-pit non session high or low or the overnight session high or low, but you should know what the normal rotation for any given product is. In other words, how, how, how far does it go? when it uh, moves up and down um, when it moves up and down on a on a regular basis so for the ES that number is two and a half to three points per rotations for so from from the high to the low back to the high to the low you see these zigzag numbers here those are generally two and a half to three points generally in the ES the probability of, of, of the market moving six, seven, or eight points without a one and a half point pullback or six tick pullback is pretty low. Uh, it is generally in the um, in the two to three percent range. Okay, and if I see if I see this market, let's say I'm stalking. Uh, by stalking means watching carefully. Like one of the trades I took earlier today was right here the short. If I'm stalking a, a short against uh, prior day's high, the open, the mid, I uh, hope you can see my chart clearly here. If I'm stalking this area right here, which I was, which I took a short in uh, this morning, I I like seeing a big rotation. This, this, this was a six and a half point rotation, the probability of a six and a half point rotation continuing to seven or eight is is in the two percent range in the ES. That's uh, six points without a single six tick pullback. That gives me confidence in the short. So in this situation, I see a push six and a half points. This is an impulsive move, a pullback two and a quarter points, and then it pushes again three and a half points before it starts to rotate again. I'm going to take the short. I'm looking for the short here. The short. Uh, the intention for the short in this situation is for it to fail to test the open, the mid, prior day's high, and then rotate back down and take out the last low at 1820 with a target of 1675, and that's what happened with this trade. Uh, all of that you can see in real-time tweets on my Twitter stream, uh, FutureStrader71, and 
what happened is it ended up pushing down to t within two ticks of my target at 1675 at 17 quarter. I always front run my targets by two ticks, always, uh, even in volatile markets, but still it was hard to get a fill at that low here. But in general, when I see a big rotation like this into an area that I'm interested in, it, it, it actually gives me more confidence because the probability that the ES will have a six and a half point rotation, a pullback, and then another six or five or, or, or you know, an exaggerated rotation to continue is unusual. When it does it, it does it on news, it does it on some release, uh, economic release or something like that, but it's unusual for it to do that. So that's one of the metrics I look for. Uh, it's a good question, Rex. Okay. Rex also wants to know if you can explain campaigning. So campaigning is a um, is a way of managing risk. Um, it's interesting. I wish I'd known that question was coming because then I would have just started up a platform here and showed you. Um, I'm going to try to do that, but uh, our time is limited. Um, Campaigning is essentially improving my entry by scalping around a position. That's what campaigning is. It's taking the current, um, the current entry. Let's say on this trade, the short at 20 uh, from the 27 half area. I got in at 26.75. Uh, if if the market starts to wiggle around in this area, if it starts to wiggle around. I trade, I look for two to three tick scalps around that, and, and as, as I bank uh, profits, uh, my risk actually, my risk profile actually improves because my, um, my average starts to climb away from my entry. Um, Again, I wish I'd known about this question. I would have loved to demonstrate that for you, but essentially, if I got in at 27, and the market starts chopping around, and nothing has changed to tell me that this trade is, that there's something wrong with this trade, uh, what I'll do is I'll start to look for it to push through 27, uh, buy a few ticks, sell that, buy them back at 27 or 26.75, and then it pushes again, sell that, and buy them again, and so on. And every time I, I get two or three ticks, the average that I entered it, uh, the average price that I entered with starts to improve. It starts to get higher and higher and higher and away from the actual noise. This is an advanced trade management strategy. It is not recommended if you have any issues taking losses or any discipline issue issues of any kind. You really need to stay away from doing this because what some people do is they uh, get in. Uh, you know, add one, they, just, they stare at the screen, they're not responding to what the market's saying, which is to get out, and then they end up, you know, turning a, a bad loser into a disaster. Uh, so it's not recommended for, for everybody. It's, uh, it's something you want to do if you have your discipline in check. But I'll, I'll take a moment to demonstrate it uh, as soon as my platform's up on this computer. It's usually on another computer. But uh, I'll try to show you that before we leave today. Okay, Brandon is asking, he says that you've stated before that you're a scale all in, scale out, but does that also mean that you scale out of losses similar to your gains? No, my losses, so I'm all in, scale out. Um, I'm all in, scale out generally uh, in, in, in almost all trades. I will scale into trades in areas of confluence, so uh, this particular trade actually would have been a scale-in trade. There's a lot going on in this area. 28 yesterday's high, 28.50 is an old point of control from which uh, the market fell a few days ago. So if you look at this right here, 28.50 is this point of control, and then on Friday we fell from that price, so that's an additional thing. Yesterday, 28 is the high, and then today we had uh, the mid, the, uh, the opening swing high, we had the mid in this area, we had VWAP, VWAP being at 29.75.30. I would have scaled, if the, this position had gone against me, I would have scaled back into this on a, on a larger rotation, and then I would have taken some off at my original entry. So I do scale in, I always scale out, and I scale out for, for the simple reason that 
I cannot tell what the future is going to hold. So my primary task is to secure uh, my risk. And I secure my risk by scaling out. So the profile um, of a scale out trade, I have actually on my uh, blog an old, old uh, post on the anatomy of a, of a scale out trade. You'll see that as soon as you scale out, your risk profile changes tremendously. It's, a, it's an asymmetric risk uh, profile when you scale out because uh, in, the, in an example that I just recently did for a stage five, uh, for a stage five uh, client only webinar, uh, I'm, by scaling out, I give up on, on a one trade that I, that I demonstrated, I gave up about 28% of, of the gain I would have secured had I held on to the full trade into the club into the into its target so I gave up 28 percent but on my first scale after I got in once I got my first scale my risk dropped 50 percent it dropped 50 percent on that first scale that's not to mention what it did on the second scale and then the target so for 28 percent I get to gain 50 percent of my risk back and to me that is I'll take that trade all day, every day, and that's what I do in real life. So to me, you know, being able to scale some of the position off and then hold a runner um, gives me that edge. And if I get stopped, yes, I do get stopped on more size because I've, I'm all in and I'm scaling out. So I'm, I'm giving up 28% on the target, but if I get stopped, I'm getting stopped on the maximum size possible. Uh, so this does not work for somebody who gets who's on a trend following program that gets stopped 70% of the time and then gets paid 30% of 30% of the time on a much much greater basis. My full stop out rate is not high, uh, so it's it's if it's if it exceeds 38%, I start to get worried. So I am not too concerned with the trades that stop me out with a full unit on. It doesn't happen all that often, or on a relative basis, it doesn't happen that often. Um, but then, as soon as the market moves in my direction, I scale something off, and it allows me, it improves my theoretical average, and it allows me to just sit there and let the market play out the plan that I'd set out for that particular trade without, without you know, over-talking it or, or micromanaging it. Okay, uh, I just want to remind everybody that you can type in your question. Usually we have so many questions that there's uh, not enough time. <laughs> and today there's, there's only about three or four questions. All right, I mean, Tony. That, that's a sign of improvement, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is the first time that's ever happened that I can remember. All right, Tony is asking, uh, he says, as the price approaches a level, what are you looking for to determine whether to skip that level or go with the direction of price into the level uh, or even to fade the price direction at the level? Um, so I don't, uh, one thing I don't do is say to myself, hey, I'm going to get short the mid and go and load the book, uh, load the, the order book with those trades uh, to short. What I do is I, I respond to the price action as it happens. So let's say, uh, for argument's sake, let's say I'm looking to get long the 13. As the market falls into that 1813 down here, I'm not actually bidding the 1813. I have no interest in standing in front of a market. There's no way for me to predict that it's going to slow down or stop at my level. My levels are just based on research and a plan, uh, but the market has to the market has to come to me in order for me to trade. Whereas most people who are having a hard time uh, that I've worked with, uh, and even the prop guys that I've backed, they tend to to be proactive and to go after. Um, after the market to trade. So they wanted to get long the 13. If they miss the trade, they're looking for any pullback up here to buy or they're just going to market so they don't miss the run up uh, back up to 2175 or whatever. I don't do that. I wait for the market to come to the level, show me what it's doing. Am I seeing participation from the other side at that level? If I am, then I'm going to give up one or two ticks to be able to get in and and uh, in a position so that I have that first scale out, which is key to my methodology, I have to get that first scale out uh, to be able to hold for the bigger move. Um, so when I determine that I'm going to get long, let's say on this drop, I've got you know uh, even in the morning trader bite, I don't know if you've watched those. And when I say I'm looking for some support at this level. 
I'm going to trade that level. I cannot choose to pass on a certain level. I can't choose, pick and choose uh, trades that I want to take or not want to take. I don't do that. Uh, if I say I'm going to be looking to get long around 1813, I'm going to get long around 1813 because I can't tell which ones work and which ones don't. However, uh, a combination of, of what the dome is saying, how the chart is reacting on this trigger chart. This is my trigger chart. Chart. It's a two tick Renko candlestick. Uh, based on how it reacts, I need to see that there's some support there. Then I go and lift the market and go with it. So I don't pass on levels where I believe that uh, a trade should be executed because then I'm just basically wasting my time. I'm just doing all this homework and stuff so that um, I can, you know, I can then pick and choose the trades that uh, that I take or don't take. I, it's it's like a system. You have to take your signals. Okay, this is a pretty similar question. So you you let me know, FT. Jeff says uh, it's been his understanding that for the past two years that you faded levels. Um, and when you got to the price that you relied on or that your dome, your dome was reading, uh, you would decide whether or not to take the trade or if you would scale out as, as folks wait for confirmation that are just getting in. Uh, could you clarify as to whether or not this is how you trade? So this kind of so, just answered that, but you let me know. Yeah, uh, I, I see what, I see what uh, Jeff is looking for here. Uh, no matter what you're doing, uh, I'm not a breakout trader. If you're not a breakout trader, which means that you basically wait for something to happen before you go to the market and watch it break, um, that's not how I enter. I fade. And it doesn't mean I'm fading the sell-off. It means that even if I want to get short, I'm going to fade a move up to get short. I do not want to place my trade uh, at a point that is so far away from where I would be wrong on the trade that it's... Now I have to trade a one lot to be able to make up for the for the risk. Uh, so even though you know the trend is down right now, uh, I'm not going to just sell new lows into yesterday's low. I still expect this to test 1804 today. This is what's expected. We have a weak low, so I'm looking for a short. I am not going to just get short. I am fading. I'm going to fade a pullback to a, to an area to get short. Uh, 1675 is that area actually, but I'm 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 on this, so I'm going to pass on this trade. But um, so I'm always fading. I'm always fading something. It doesn't mean that I'm always I'm trading the classic market profile. You know, find value, fade value. Uh, uh, even in a trend day, I will fade a pullback. Uh, but I I still don't put my orders out there for the market to pick off. I'm proactive about my entry and I'm proactive about my scaleouts. Um, it, it, my entries do combine some dome reading. Uh, you know, I want to see what velocity there is at the at the areas that I want to trade. So I'm going to pull up the demo here because I'm on the on my charting. So I'm watching things like velocity. So I, I want to get short. Here, let's put this. This is what I manage trades with the trade analyzer. So I want to get short. Uh, I'm looking for a short here. There's nothing for me to do here. I'm looking for the market to give me some idea about uh, where where to get short. So uh, there's nothing for me to do here, but I'm going to look to fade against some support or something um, to be able to get that short on. We don't need this chart, so I'm just going to kill it, and then we can squeeze this over so I can see more of the screen. And as the market makes its decision to push one way or another, uh, I'm looking for a reaction. So we can do a bunch of dome reading here, but we don't have time for that. There's 10 minutes left. But I'm looking for which way is this more aggressive. Uh, if you're not good at reading this, uh, there's a tool out there that I really like. It's called Jigsaw, uh, Jigsaw Tools. I actually have them on this platform. Uh, that show you what changes in a dome, and Peter does a good job of explaining how he uses it to trade. So I'd recommend that as a tool that helps you, that helps support your um, trade decisions. But no tool is going to help you if you're just randomly trading the market just based on how it prints. Uh, you need to make a decision first as to what the market's trying to do, how good of a job are the buyers or the sellers doing, and then decide 
decide, okay, my bias is to, is to get short. I'm looking for new lows. I'm looking for this 12th quarter to go. And then now your job is very narrow as a trader. Your jo job is narrowed down to finding an entry that causes the market to more easily give you a scale out than a stop out. So if I'm finding an entry, I'm if short, I'm not going to wait for it to come back to 1650 and push through uh, to get short. I'm looking for failure out of this balance here. Uh, so it's probably not going to do that um, in the time period allotted because we have probably have more questions. But I do watch how it prints. A three lot up, two more, three more, 30, 25 more, one lot prints down, 67 print up. There are buyers still active in this area. It's not giving up yet. That's the sort of thing I'm looking for. And on the dome, I'm looking for what is on the bid or offer. This is the offer. This is the bid. How much is trading on the bid or offer? And what is the velocity of it? Well, how quickly are, the, are those prints coming and how aggressively? Is it absorbing uh, or is it just take, you know, is it somebody constantly taking away So, so here's here it's starting to break. I would look for the short here to sell. I did, I missed it. Doing too many things at once. But it's starting here. It's starting to show you it's got failure. So this is where I would start to bang away at it, just like I tried at uh, I think 1475 or 1450, and then I start to manage everything with the trade analyzer. And this is where I would campaign. So here's a simple campaign strategy. Let's let that get filled. So I'm filled. Change that to one lots, and see how it treats that four lot right now, and then I'll start to manage the trade based on how the market's treating this. So I'm expecting the market to pull back up to 15 here in the short term. And as it pulls back to the 15, I'll sell the 15, I'll sell 14.75 and I'll take back 14. Back and forth, back and forth until it decides to break. Looks like it's breaking. Anyway, sorry Mike, I, I know you didn't intend these AMAs to be a lesson in dome reading, but this is this is a topic that I get so many questions on uh, via email and so on, and I thought this would be convenient to, to address. Sure. I can take other questions. Sure. Yeah, no like. problem. And I just want to quickly mention that uh, for anybody that likes the uh, jigsaw stuff, if you're a BMT Elite member, there's a there's a coupon code there. All right, Jeff is asking, he says he's seen recently some poor highs and poor lows uh, today as an example. At which point in today's example do you determine that sellers are in control? Um, that's, that's a big question because it's all based on context. So there's a poor high up here. Uh, but the market found sellers have put in it put in a poor high, but it could not hold those prices, and it starts to push through the mid and back into the prior day's range. It's the sell side, so now you're attacking poor lows more than you're attacking poor highs. Uh, that's what the context is that is governing the trade. It's that simple. Okay. Um, See how I took the one lot off, I think maybe at 13 quarter. See now my average is 18.14.83 instead of 18.14.50. So if I, if I, and I have three on left, if I wanted to scratch this trade, my scratch price is now 14.75. Campaigning means adding, adding one, taking one off here, I'll add another one. So as soon as I, as soon as I take this off, as soon as I get filled here at 13 quarter, this price will improve. See how it dropped back to 1456? My average on the screen is 1425. That is not a true average. And it's not because the, the S5 trading platform is wrong. This is how all platforms work. See now I got filled at 13 quarter for my scale out, how my average improved to 1815. So now on the three lot, my scratch price is actually 1815. See how it improved from 1415 to 1815, uh, 1450 to, eight, to 15 even? And it'll continue to do that. That's what campaigning is. That's too tight. It's probably going to take the low out. So here it is, the theoretical average again changing uh, to, to take into account the profits that I've already banked 
on this trade. And that's what campaigning is. It's basically trading around the position so that I can improve my price over um, over this over this area. We have a double bottom at 1225. It is unlikely that this bottom will hold. So I'm working this 12 even as it'll, it'll probably one ticket at least. Again, this is a this is not suitable for all traders. This is an advanced way to manage trades. You want to hit me with the next question? Yeah, real quick. Does your theoretical average include commissions or no? No, it doesn't. This is this whole platform is based on ticks. We don't want to talk about dollars when we look at trading uh, because we're trading for we're measuring performance by ticks and when you measure performance by ticks it's agnostic to all um, it's agnostic to the product that you're trading uh, and and commissions are not included in this and the historical trade analyzer will have um, will have commissions included see this one ticked so now we're in danger here so this is in danger because it only one tick that low not liking this anymore. Rex wants to know what's the tightest stop that you normally use on the ES? Tightest probably three, four ticks generally, six, six to ten ticks generally. Keith is saying that uh, you mentioned a six point rotation. Should we get that off the bottom today? Or if we got that off the bottom today, would you short it? You mentioned you're looking for 1800. I'm, I'm sorry, say that again. I didn't get that question. Yeah, Keith says you mentioned a six point rotation, and if we got that off the bottom today, would you short it? You mentioned you're looking for 1800, he says. Uh, no, I wouldn't just short a six point rotation up just for the heck of it. The, the six point rotation pushed, pushed us into that key area, the 20, uh, 28, 2850 area, and that's why I'm interested. So I'm not looking to buy or sell any rotation that is, you know, six points plus. That is not a trading plan. You're just basically trading randomly. Um, so if, for me, it, it, I, first I have to determine what direction am I going, what area am I interested in, and then, and then allow the market to show me its hand, you know, who's in control. Um, and then I, I look for those bigger rotations to hit the market. It doesn't necessarily have to, I, I don't necessarily always have to trade on a big rotation. Uh, I'm simply looking for a big rotation to add, add to my confidence in that trade. And if it doesn't work, generally the market takes me out right away, which I prefer. If my stop gets hit, I don't want to sit there and get one tick and one tick. And I want it to just blow right through and take my stop out fast. Um, so generally when you have a big rotation into a level, the market has a harder time uh, pushing into, uh, pushing in through that level and, and, and stopping you out right away. But if it does, it just means that I'm really, really wrong, which I'm, which I'm okay with as well. Right. Let me combine a couple of questions here. Uh, Ron wants to know what chart you're looking at to determine if you're correct with your entry and uh, Tiger is saying, what kind of chart are you using? What is a two-tick Renko chart? Okay, so um, I'm looking at a 15-minute with, with volume profiles to figure out what my, uh, my overall lay of the land is. So this is showing me three days of regular trading hour trading each one showing me the volume profile for the day. Uh, and based on that, I'm measuring how the auction is going. Um, in addition to that, I'm looking at a composite. This is the volume of at every price going back to October 9, 2013. And I'm basically seeing where traders traded a lot. Like this is, see this area with the three prongs here, three volume prongs? This is a high volume uh, area and this is where we stopped as we sold off on Thursday on that big sell-off day this is where we stopped right down here 24 is the last prong in this high volume area and the low is 2375 and what we've done is basically struggled with this area so far we're trying to maintain this because participants like these prices in the past the market has memory so that gives me a big picture thing so all day long I'm watching this 15 minute but what I'm looking at doing 
those trader bites or the homework, I'm looking at the big picture. I'm always starting with, okay, what has the market done? What it, who's in control here? Lately, we've been in balance since October, uh, March 4th. Uh, and then we broke out of that balance to the downside. So if we broke out of that balance to the downside and we moved away from the 64.50, these, this move started from 66.50, then my, the next logical place for the market to test, now that it's told us, hey, I can't hold these prices, uh, we're going lower, once it breaks, I expect this 1800 and that's why I mentioned it earlier. So I expect this to be the area to be tested next. And it could, it could sit here for a couple days trying to make higher lows and, lower, and higher highs back into that balance zone. But the expectation is this auction is not complete until it pushes down to 1800 to find the buyers that were left behind there. So that's the big picture and that's basically what I'm looking at uh, to form my bias for the day. But the immediate bias for the next trade is off of a 15-minute, and, and it combines a whole bunch of uh, stats that I've done, uh, even on uh, on a prior uh, Big Mike webinar, in a combination of uh, with how is today trading. Uh, today pushed out of the prior two days range. So this is Friday, this is Monday. We've pushed out of the prior day's range. We were looking for 34.50 this morning. It pushed to 37 and a quarter and it came right back and has traded back into the prior day's value. So short is it. I'm going to be looking for shorts until this market pushes right back over 25 and 28. I'm going to be looking short. So I'm going to be fading anything that moves up just like you saw in that demo. Um, okay. So that's what forms my ideas. Bart is asking, what do you think about automated trading systems that are offered by other brokerages as they advertise them as a pretty good result? Uh, Bart, um, <laughs> so I, I, it's tough for me to answer that question because uh, uh, I, 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 you know, I'm a partner in a brokerage. Uh, we do offer some trading systems, but I always approach trading systems with skepticism. Uh, the, the, I've been involved with creating uh, automated systems and, and also been involved with some pretty poor results, live results, even though the demo or hypotheticals looked amazing. Um, and that's been my experience. However, with the newer stuff that we're working on now, I do a lot more vetting. I'm able to see the code. I'm able to see what it's what it does. Are there stops? When does do the stops trigger and things like that? Um, I'm going to tell you that unless you trust the broker recommending it, meaning the broker, not the brokerage, the broker, broker, the person, um, you need to do a lot of due diligence. And unfortunately, because you are a consumer, you're not able to see what the program does. Uh, in my opinion. Uh, you you know it is hard to invest in anything, be it a trading system or uh, a hedge fund or whatever, and then base the results on the first few trades. You when you make that investment, essentially this is risk capital. This is money that you're willing to lose without affecting your lifestyle, and you need to kind of review it on a quarterly, on the tight side, quarterly if not semi-annual basis because you may be getting into a system during its drawdown period and as soon as you get out the drawdown period's over and it starts to turn and my per first preference is to um, is, is to find a good broker and I'm not trying to advertise uh, my brokerage here I'm just telling you that as a trader find a good broker somebody who's uh, who's maybe a referral has a good reputation and is who's actually taking their job and their fiduciary responsibility seriously enough to make sure that you stay out of harm's way. A good broker knows that if you do well, then they do well because you'll continue to, to, to do your trading and all of that through them so they can get paid on your live trades through commissions. A poor broker just wants you to get in, wants you to trade at the lowest amount of margin possible uh, trade as much as possible and then as soon as they have you in they're moving on to the next. That's the industry standard in my opinion and that's what we created uh, stage five to change. Um, but if I, if I had $5,000 to invest into a trading system or into myself unless I know for sure and trust my broker or somebody recommending a system or somebody who's created a system, 
I would more likely invest in myself, trade something small, a micro product like the micro euro or micro Australian and work out my psychological and technical issues there and then invest in myself as a trader. Um, barring that, then, then systems, you know, buyer beware, I would say uh, I have not been an insider in the industry. I have not seen very much out there that, uh, that I'd be willing to invest in. Uh, and we're spending a significant amount of time and effort uh, looking into those solutions because more and more people want to add trading systems as a side note to their actual discretionary trading. I know that doesn't yeah. help you, but that's as good as I can. Any, that's as good as I can offer. Anybody that that really wants to know more on automated uh, trading, there's a really good thread on BNT that I highly recommend. It's the title of the thread you can search for is "Taking a Trading System Live," and it's by Kevin uh, Kevin Davy, and it's really excellent because he goes through the entire process, and there's there's uh, the entire gamut of questions and answers. Um, and it can really show you, even if you don't write your own code, it can show you exactly how things materialize and what to expect and how to measure it. You know. So anyway, all right, we're, yeah, we're a few edu minutes. Education is key. Yeah, absolutely. We're a few minutes past the thirty minutes, so we're going to stop here. If anybody did not get their questions answered, you can post them on the AMA thread on BMT, and FT will do his best to get those answered in the coming days. I'll post the yep. recording there later today also. So thanks again, FT, as always, and uh, we'll see you again in a couple weeks. Thanks for having me on. Sure. Bye, guys. Sure.